Welcome back to Seek Strength and welcome back to Seekistan. Today we're talking about 20 tips in regards to recovery for training. Now, recovery is a very interesting topic and there's a lot of nuance to recovery. But first of all, we should probably have some definition of what we mean by recovery. Recovery is essentially returning to a normal physiological or psychological state when it comes to exercise. However, there's a couple of different subcontexts we put on recovery when we're training. Let's say we're six weeks into a 12-week training camp for a competition or a fight or something like that. We don't need to be fully recovered like we would be on week 12. We just need to be recovered enough to perform the next training session adequately enough to meet our goals, assuming the programming is correct. But recovery then for a taper or for a competition is a different style of recovery. So when we're saying we're recovered, it depends on the position or training, how far along we are in that training session or those training blocks. And the recovery we need does vary from time to time because ultimately there is a lot of nuance recovery. And that brings us to our first point. A lot of people will try to sell you stuff that will improve your recovery. And that may be true contextually, but you can't really improve your recovery beyond its maximal baseline. Now, The good thing is there's a lot of things you're not doing or there's a lot of things you are doing that are negatively impacting your recovery. So if you imagine recovery currently is a kind of a static baseline or this is your optimal goal standard recovery, this is the best possible recovery you could have without the use of PEDs. Most of us aren't operating at that level through every single week and every single training session of every single training block. Most of us are operating in between different levels of efficiency, between kind of 60 and 90% of that, or far worse, depending on what you're doing. For example, if someone is working 12 night shifts in a physical job, as opposed to someone who is a full-time athlete, we have such different capacities for that gold standard and the best optimal recovery you could possibly have. So if anyone's trying to sell you stuff, as far as the literature shows, there's nothing that can really improve recovery right now that's in any way meaningful outside of PEDs. But again, there's lots of stuff you can do that will improve your recovery or your relative recovery, but not improve your absolute recovery or in in any notable fashion. Now, tip number two is I know a lot of you strength athletes are not doing this one. I know a lot of our weightlifters and a lot of our powerlifters aren't doing enough of this, but improving your aerobic capacity. So your aerobic capacity can be very easily improved by just some steady state, low intensity cardio, steady state cardio, zone two work pretty frequently. So improving your aerobic capacity will make a big difference because there's a couple of different ways. So generally a healthier will improve that recovery capacity. So just being a healthier individual will improve your metabolic health. It'll reduce the time between sets, reduce the total time per training. So then reducing total levels of exposure to cortisol, stress, the longer training sessions are. Even if we're not doing a huge amount more volume per training session, we're getting a more fatiguing training session, which is going to extend that recovery curve. So aerobic capacity is quite a subtle, almost insidious, but the positive side of insidious when we're looking at impacting recovery. Having a baseline, a better quality aerobic capacity is hugely beneficial for all athletes. Now in other sports, you know, rugby players, runners, any other sport, that's not a strength sport, usually have a pretty good base of aerobic capacity. And so this one won't be a massively beneficial one for you. But for our strength athletes watching, there's a huge chance, a little bit of steady state cardio, three to five times a week, will make a notable difference in your recovery in about six to nine months. If you give it nice, consistent training and you do it at the right times and you build up to it slowly and adequately, you will notice that your ability to recover between training sessions and recover in that training session has improved. And it's definitely something worth investing your time in. Tip number three then is do not do active recovery sessions. Now, what are active recovery sessions? Most of the time, they're the day following a large training session or maybe multiple training sessions in the same day. You go in, maybe you're still a bit tight. You have a significant amount of DOMS. Maybe you haven't quite repleted those glycogen stores from the day before. Maybe there's some waste products still left around your system. So in most cases, an active recovery session will look like some light work on the rower. Maybe if you're playing a field sport, you're moving a ball around. Maybe you're doing some lighter intensity sports specific movements, but in all of these cases, essentially you're just doing extra training. So there's no such thing as an amount of training that costs you nothing. You're still going to be utilizing glycogen. You're still going to be burning up energy in those muscle cells. You're still going to need to recover from that, even though you mightn't have induced the same level of damage you have in the days previously. So what is the background behind recovery sessions why do people think they're doing them 
Well, the background is, is that you're going to do a level of work that will never reach into that kind of overreaching level. So we're never going to have a physiological stimulus from it. Most of the time, if we're doing sports-specific work, we're never actually going to have valuable motor cognitive stimuli from it because you're not doing anything intense enough in a specific enough realm. So if you're a weightlifter and you're moving a barbell around to 20 kilos, you're not really getting any valuable practice from that. And everything you're doing is just adding to the total fatigue that's in your system. Now, there are cases where some active recovery can be good, and we're going to talk about those later. But in terms of going and doing an active recovery session or coining the term active recovery and putting that on one of your sessions, you should always just classify this as extra training. Maybe it's not as voluminous. Maybe it's not as intense. Maybe we do different movements, but never think about it like active recovery Always just think about it as you're doing extra training in your week or in your month. Number four then is be generally physically active throughout the day. So Owen talked on this earlier on. He said you want to have good aerobic capacity, but being physically active throughout your workday when you're not training can be really beneficial as well, just in terms of getting your system moving around. If we have some muscle tightness or some DOMS that's holding on from previous sessions, a bit of loosening out through just being generally active, like walking around the place, having that non-exercise activity is really, really valuable. So your circulatory system is working, your lymph system is working to flush out those waste products. It is terribly beneficial to be generally active throughout the day. Now, the other aspect of being more active throughout the day is when we start looking at our posture and kind of regressing towards secondary positions, due to muscle soreness. So if I've gone and deadlifted yesterday, and maybe my mid back or my upper back is quite fatigued, when I sit at my desk today, my posture is much more likely to regress to that secondary position. A small amount of mid and upper back flexion, some internal rotation of the shoulders, and that just allows me to sit here comfortably even though it's not an ideal position to sit in. When we force ourselves to be a small bit more active, maybe that's setting an alarm every 30 or 45 minutes for sitting at a desk. Maybe it's forcing yourself just to go for a quick five or 10 minute walk after your meals throughout the day. This will ensure that that posture is opened up. You're not regressing into these positions or tightening up or shortening up those muscles anymore. And as we said, your whole system is just going to be a bit more healthier because of it. Number five is hydration, or rather ingestion of water. So one of the few things I remember from my four years of biochemistry during university, in my fourth year, one of my fourth year labs, in terms of practical experiments we were doing in the lab, I remember one of my lecturers said, and now for the most important ingredient in all biochemical reactions is water. So what does that mean? What's this got to do with this video? Every single biochemical reaction, every biochemistry reaction going on in your body requires water to carry out. So inadequate hydration or hypohydration as known in the literature is something that can have huge impacts across all areas of your performance. So if that is muscle strength, which can be reduced between 5 and 8%, if we look at aerobic or anaerobic capacity, it can be reduced even further, sometimes up to 8 to 10%. And one of the most interesting aspects about being hypohydrated is that inadequate hydration is strongly linked with injury or your risk of injury. So there's very few things we can say in sport and exercise science that will really significantly reduce your chances of being injured, and that is being hypohydrated or rather being adequately hydrated. Now, the question of whether you should be ingesting you know, minerals, if you should be adding electrolytes to your hydration, to your water, should you be adding carbohydrates, is something that is probably, and as of yet, not really well answered by some people. Some people have very strong opinions, there's some very large companies that sponsor large YouTubers who have certain hydration formulas, which we've used some of those. And to be honest, there's probably no real negative to using those. So it's probably a worthwhile endeavor if financially it's of no impact to you to use some things like this. But when it comes to actually how much water you need to ingest, it's worth following the Galpin formula, which is probably one of the more uh, recent ways of trying to quantify how much water you need to drink. And that is body weight in pounds divided by 30 and the number of ounces of water to ingest per 15 minutes of exertion. So for a lot of people, that could be quite an amount of hydration. If you're training for an hour and a half, that could, for some people, be up to two liters or more. If you're doing multiple sessions a day, which some of you could be doing, that is several liters of water, nearly a gallon of water, a, a European gallon of water per day during those training sessions. So for some of us, it's a pretty reasonable amount of water, but for other people, it actually takes quite a diligent effort to ingest that much water during those training sessions. You could add certain things like that. To, you could add your creatine to that water. You could add your essential amino acids if you're using them. But 
What's most important is that you're drinking an adequate amount of water during those training sessions as it is very, very important for all aspects of your training. So tip number six then is protein. And this is probably the most obvious tip when it comes to nutritional aids to recovery is having adequate levels of protein there. Now, everybody understands, everybody will start going, they'll start a training block and they'll go and buy their brand new thing of whey protein or they'll buy some branched chain amino acids and all that is great. But the main thing you need to consider over the course of the day when you're trying to recover is just having enough protein there. Now, for most of us, if we're involved in sports and involved in training in any real serious way, you're looking at probably two grams of protein per kilo of body weight. So if you're around 100 kilos, you're talking about 200 grams of protein. Now, 200 grams of protein doesn't seem like a lot, but I guarantee you, if you start noting down the total amount of protein you're getting every day, you will be under that level very, very frequently. So what does protein do for us? It's obviously the building blocks for all of our muscle cells and all our muscle tissue. It's vitally important that when you're recovering from those micro tears that come through injury or from those acute injuries you might have, that we have protein available to those cells so they can rebuild themselves. Now, the second big advantage of having protein readily available in our bloodstream is that if we're in a calorie deficit so a lot of the time as we're training we might be slightly below that calorie deficit and our body might be looking for areas of efficiency to be built up when we have higher levels of protein available in our bloodstream we're less likely to lose muscle tissue due to that calorie deficit so when we're in a calorie deficit the first thing that always goes is muscle tissue all the time it's the least efficient thing we have on our body it's the thing our body is constantly trying to get rid of so if you're training incredibly hard maybe not getting always getting our correct amount of calories in in those cases, we're very likely going to lose some muscle tissue or lose some muscle density. When we have readily available protein in our bloodstream, that's less likely to happen. So firstly, make sure you get the correct amount of protein every day. Then make sure you have protein in your system as you're recovering from training. You're a lot less likely to be quite so beat up the next day or to lose that muscle density or muscle tissue. Number six is ingestion of carbohydrates post-training. So carbohydrates are quite interesting and post-training nutrition is something that's been a hot topic for quite a long period of time. And in regards to that anabolic window has largely been dispelled in regards to the longitudinal view of you gaining muscle. However, when we're looking for between intra-training session recovery, carbohydrates after training have some pretty interesting effects. So in absence of protein and just carbohydrates post-training, we see what carbohydrates have is not really an anabolic effect, but rather an anti-catabolic effect. So this is in the absence of protein. Now, we're not saying you should have just carbohydrates post-training. In fact, just as Fitz mentioned, you should be having both protein and carbohydrates post-training. But the novelty of just about 100 grams of carbohydrates post-training are demonstrationally valuable in preserving that muscle tissue. And more importantly, or as importantly for you, when you're doing a lot of training sessions in terms of athletic endeavors, is recovery of intramuscular glycogen. So storage of glycogen in your muscles and your liver are very, very useful. Now these, when we're doing things like, you know, strength training we don't use as much as we might necessarily think or as much as we'd like to believe when we're eating our seven bowls of cereal post training however nice it might be but we still are using quite a bit of that if you're someone who's training nine times a week the ingestion of carbohydrates post training is a valuable nutrient timing aspect to take care of it's not going to be a game changer but all of these added up together with that momentum is very very valuable so We'll often think of that post-training protein ingestion, which is, again, definitely a good idea, but I would really uh, suggest you consider the addition of carbohydrates. You don't necessarily need that 100 grams of carbohydrates post-training, but in the combination of protein plus carbohydrates post-training, what you can valuably spare throughout the day, because you don't want to be sparing all of your carbohydrates just after training. Some people have limited numbers, depending on what you're doing with your body mass, if you're trying to gain or lose it, but adequately and surgically inserting some carbohydrates post-training is absolutely a good idea. Number eight is just being super conscious that caloric deficits will hurt your recovery. Now you may need to be and maybe you should be in a caloric deficit whether that's for your health or whether that's for cutting for competition. It may be unavoidable or it may be the best thing you do but it's very very important to understand that caloric deficits are something that will 
negatively impact your recovery, whether that's to a normal amount or if you're being very severe or very unthoughtful with your nutrition during your caloric deficit to a larger extent. So there's a couple of different aspects. It's the reduction of that protein. It's the reduction of those carbohydrates. It's a reduction of micronutrients. Cutting calories is stressful. So stress is one of those overall things that while people say, you know, reduce your stress, which is largely a meaningless and worthless statement to tell people because it's not possible to just reduce your stress and your perception of stress. But dieting is something that adds a large amount of psychological stress. And as a result of that, then we end up with a lot of physiological stress, which negatively impacts the recovery between training sessions. So the goal here is if you're in a caloric deficit, is not so much stop the caloric deficit, although that would be useful for your recovery and your training performance. It's rather be super mindful that in your caloric deficit, you need to be conscious of maintaining that protein as much as possible. You need to be main conscious of that nutrient timing, like those carbohydrates post-training sessions. You need to be conscious of, am I getting all of those essential micronutrients that I need to get, which is something that often falls out of favor when we're focusing on a caloric deficit because we're worried about our macros we're thinking protein fats and carbs but when you don't eat such a large volume of food you're reducing your possible kind of shotgun approach of ingesting essential micronutrients and this is all the way from things like choline down to copper and zinc so we're looking at trace elements all of these things the chances of ingesting those things is reduced by being in a caloric deficit and as such a lot of these act as cofactors during enzymes and metabolic reactions and all of these add up to that percentage in reduction of your recovery capacity. Tip number nine then is be wary of body fat percentage. Both very high and very low will definitely negatively impact your ability to recover in between training sessions. So if we have very very high levels of body fat we're carrying around a lot of extra body fat maybe we're 22 25 even higher than that percent body fat it's going to be a couple of issues that come up and become very prevalent when we're trying to recover from hard training the first of these is systematic inflammation so it's standard if you get a punch in the eye your eye is going to swell out It'll, the area will become inflamed and then through a lymphatic system we will have a drainage of that overall inflammation now when we have very high levels of body fat we tend to be more inflamed overall and then when we add in the inflammation that comes from a training session or multiple training sessions that becomes more difficult to dissipate so our system has to work harder to get rid of that inflammation we tend to live our lives in much higher levels of inflammation constantly and then our recovery is very negatively affected because of that now, the second aspect that comes along with those very high levels of body fat is that we don't have very good ways of dealing with high blood sugar levels. So if you have somebody who's quite lean and they have a lot of muscle tissue, that muscle tissue acts as a sink for that glycogen or that glucose in our system. So rather than our liver or our pancreas having to produce hormones, which will then shuttle that into fat cells, when we're quite lean and we have a large amount of muscle tissue, that glucose goes into glycogen in the muscles and it's far, far easier for our body to deal with. Now, if we don't have quite so much muscle and we have more fat, then our body has to produce insulin. That insulin is then used for the shuttling of that glucose into the fat cells. And that is its own whole other area of issues or health concerns down the road. So generally speaking, for the best possible recovery, we don't want to have incredibly high levels of body fat. Now, on the bottom end of this, there's also a level of concern. And this concern comes from 10% body fat or below in natural athletes. You're starting to have some issues there with your hormone regulation. Obviously, that fat tissue is very, very important for our hormone regulation. And so in certain cases, particularly in female athletes and in youths, we will have some hormonal dysregulation going on when they are too lean. So it is something to be concerned with. But for most of us, it's the upper end of body fat percentage we are really concerned with when it comes to our recovery. Number 10 in our list then is static stretching. So static stretching, holding our muscle in a lengthened position for a long period of time to try and loosen out the muscle or maybe to try and lengthen that range of motion. Now, this is a really valuable tool. We're massive fans of static stretching here at Sika, but... What happens when we start doing long hold static stretching at the end of a rigorous training session is all of those micro tears in the muscle start to elongate. 
So a muscle like my hamstrings, if I've just done five sets of 12 on RDLs, my hamstring already has some damage in it. Maybe it's not only the muscle, but the tendon. Maybe I have some uh, inflammation around those joints as well. If I then start going and really hitting my hamstrings hard, really trying to stretch them out, I'm elongating those micro tears. I'm increasing the level of inflammation that's around those joints. So in the case where I might have a lot of ground to make up, Maybe I've come from playing a field sport and then coming into weightlifting and I really need to smash my calves and my ankles. Then in that case, some pre-fatigue of those two muscles in our calf might be very valuable before I go in. Make sure the muscle is loose, make sure the muscle is limber, and then I can really start stretching it out and really get a lot of valuable work in. But if I'm on the other end of that scale and I'm trying to build muscle or I'm trying to ensure I'm recovered for my next training session, then essentially holding those static stretches for a long time immediately after exercise is going to elongate that recovery window. It's going to make it far, far harder for that muscle to recover and it'll probably cause problems later down the line. Number 11 is intelligent programming. So when we're training, like we talked about, we're not necessarily trying to be the most recovered state we can possibly be. We're just trying to recover enough at the right period of time during the right period in the training block to force some adaption. So if we think of recovery as the things we're doing outside of training, training is the stimulus we're applying, and then hopefully we receive the stimulus, we try to recover for it, and hopefully then some form of super compensation happens, whether that's in muscle growth, strength adaption, whether that's in athletic endeavors, or combination of all of those, which is most likely what's going on. So smart training balances your capacity to recover, or your perceived or your expected capacity to recover with applying enough of a stimulus so of course if we far exceed our ability to train with a huge amount of recovery and we vastly under train we end up in this scenario then where we're not really adapting to training we're actually probably decaying in terms of our athletic performance because we're not sending the right signal to our body to maintain or improve upon these certain endeavors or components that we want to improve on whether that's that muscle mass or that's that strength training or it's that speed if we're under training and not over recovering but far exceeding that capacity we're not applying a big enough stimulus we don't end up improving then on the opposite end of the spectrum we have overtraining now overtraining is real whenever any short or motivational goggins influence thing you've seen overtraining is very very real there's clinical symptoms of overtraining and it can happen to athletes and it has happened it has very detrimental effects and a very long extended tail of recovery post overtraining now overtraining is very very hard to get to it requires a lot of physiological and psychological stress and it's something that takes months or years to build up in some cases but it can happen so what we're looking for is to strike that right balance in the middle we're looking at smart programming while applying all these other aspects to our training to recover now might i insert a little ad here the seek a strength app on ios and android is something that we've brought out in the last couple of months spend a lot of time working on it and this will help you it will respond to your training sessions and you say you didn't hit a certain set, it will adjust the preceding loads because you haven't essentially matched that recovery capacity, among other many great features. Number 12 then is understand that new movements hurt more. So if you've been a powerlifter or a weightlifter or a bodybuilder and you're going to the gym, maybe you've heard some people talking about aerobic capacity being important and you say, okay, I'm going to sort it out now. I'm going to start going back to jogging. I used to run eight years ago when I used to play five-a-side football, now I'm going to get back to it. Within the first two or three sessions, you're going to have some pretty severe pain. Maybe you'll have some pain in your ankles, pain in your calves. Maybe you'll have some re-immersion of some shin splints you had previously. And this is just very, very simply, your body might have adapted to it previously, but it is no longer in a place where it can take those kind of loads. Now, this is a very, very similar case to somebody who hasn't done pull-ups in a long time. Maybe they have the requisite strength. Maybe they're light enough to be doing enough pull-ups. And they go hop up on the pull-up bar, or they go to a climbing wall, and for the next week afterwards, their arms are absolutely hanging off them. They might feel like they've torn a bicep tendon. Now, in these cases, what you have to understand is the on-ramp onto those training blocks and the initial few weeks of training is going to be difficult. It's not necessarily that you're doing a major amount of damage, but it's just that that initial adaptation period is more severe. You will have more DOMS from it. And so in those cases, when we're looking at athletes who may be in their second training block of the year, or maybe they're 50% of the way through a 16-week block, and then we need to add in something new, in those cases, we always look at adding something that they are in some way familiar with. So 
these new exercises are great, they bring on a new stimulus, but if we're in an important period of training, or if we're in a period of training where something else completely is the priority, we look for a training tool or an exercise selection that is going to be in some way familiar and won't massively overstress the system. This is the reason we see so many strength athletes using rowing machines and stationary bikes for aerobic work rather than going out on the road and running. So this is always a concern when we're bringing something new into training. That initial period of adaptation is going to hurt. There will be, for want of a better term, some growing pains with bringing something new in. In certain cases, that's great. But if you're in an important period of training, that recovery is really going to eat into your sports-specific stuff. Number 13, then is that small things hurt recovery and they really hurt performance. What I'm talking about by small things is blisters, tears on your hands, small breaks or dislocations in the finger. All of these small injuries, you probably wouldn't even class them as a proper injury, even uh, skin tears or skin cuts if you're running or if you're squatting, if you have a cut in your knee, that's going to affect it. And in these cases, it might sound funny, but you're just going to have to be careful. If you're within the last two months of a major competition, there's no way you're going to hop up on a pull-up bar and start doing kipping uh, pull-up or straight bar muscle-ups because you're going to tear your hand. If you're going and doing a run and you forgot to bring your running shoes and somebody else has some spare running spikes there on the track, you don't put those spikes on because those small injuries, even though the entirety of your physique could be absolutely ready to go, a small injury to the hand or foot can be absolutely detrimental. Now, if you're a combat sports athlete and you do jiu-jitsu, we would consider tears to the ear or cauliflower ears to be exactly along those same lines. Any sort of damage to a cauliflower is no major big deal. You can keep training with it for months and months and years and you'll keep building up these small baby's fists on your ears until suddenly you might be at the first fight of five fights in a competition. The back of your ear tears because you have a massive calcified lump within it and now you're not really able to do the rest of your fights or you'll have to tape your head and continually stop your preceding fights due to the fact you didn't take care of that cauliflower in the first place. All of these small things are very, very cosmetic. We'll see people walk around gyms with flaps of skin hanging from their hand and they mightn't think anything of it. That's okay. It's cool to be tough like that or not really pay attention to it. But if you want to be the most diligent athlete possible, you need to be taking care of it. Whether that's bringing a pummel stone with you to training, whether that's a small razor blade or scalpel, just keep on top of those calluses, or even a small single-use uh, bottle of super glue for gluing any of those cuts over as soon as you've cleaned and sterilized them, this will make a massive difference to being able to continue training longer and longer into those training blocks and making sure none of those competition efforts are sacrificed by some small inconvenience that really shouldn't be holding you back. Number 14 is massage or foam rolling or soft tissue work. So you might have seen a recent short I talked about during a training session where I was saying don't fear soft tissue work. Don't let the angry online physios talk you out of doing some soft tissue work. So soft tissue work can often be oversold for certain values like maybe curing an injury completely or maybe it's preventing injuries, which is stuff that is very, very hard to say conclusively. However, there are certain things that we can say quite confidently that massage or recovery can do. It can reduce your perception of DOMS. Some cases, if you receive massage or foam roll after a training session, it can reduce your chances of getting DOMS. Now, you might say, do DOMS matter? If my perception of DOMS changes, does that really improve my recovery? So if we look at a couple of different other aspects of massage, so if we have muscular tightness, sometimes we refer to this as adhesions, some therapists will refer to this as muscular tone in regards to how supple the muscle tissue is and how freely you can move that joint. Now, it's very, very clear that soft tissue work, soft tissue massage, massage from someone else or foam rolling can improve this, whether that's temporarily or for long term, depending on how much you do it. So what we're recovering, what we're really worried about when we're recovering is how freely can I move? So if I train in one session and I do all these other aspects of my training, hydration, carbohydrates, sleep, all that good stuff, but then I have some muscular tightness. Maybe I was doing a very big jiu-jitsu session and I was pulling someone in real close for an hour and a half as tight as possible. And now I have some muscular tightness or reduction in muscular tone in my arm. And this may remove or may change after a couple of sessions. But those preceding sessions, 
are not as good as they could be. So in effect, I have not recovered adequately. Now, if I can go do something to improve that, if that's massage, whether that's from someone else or me doing it, and I improve my range of motion, when we're looking at athletic endeavors, we have ticked one of the boxes that we we're looking for in the subcontext of recovery. I have restored range of motion that was temporarily reduced. And then for I have, in effect, ticked one of the boxes or the attributes that I want to recover for training sessions. Now, there's a couple of other interesting aspects about massage. When we're moving from that kind of sympathetic to parasympathetic nervous system, massages from someone else, if they're not a full, all-out intense sports massage, can help you relax and calm the nervous system, move from that sympathetic fight or flight state to this calmer state, which will reduce our cortisol levels, which will help the metabolic process of beginning to recover happening. Because when we're in this largely fight or flight state, these recovery processes aren't quite as well activated or quite as well affect. So if we can calm ourselves down a little bit, now this self-massage may not be as useful for this, this kind of compassionate touch as weird as that sounds, is actually something that's quite valuable in going from those states. If you go to a five-star resort and you go to that spa, you're very, very relaxed and you're very, very more likely to get better quality sleep. You're more likely to be more relaxed. Your resting heart rate is lower. It may impact your HRV and any number of other important aspects. So massage has a couple of benefits. It's not really that it's going to prevent injury. It might not necessarily cure your injury immediately, but it could assist in it. But when we're looking at session to session in the absence of injury, soft tissue work or massage is something that we very much prize when we're looking for quality of movement because we always want to keep that quality of movement high during training sessions. And if this is something we can do to improve that, then it is valuable in the context of recovery. Number 15 then, speaking about cortisol levels and stress levels, is understanding your total level of stress. So we talk about stress all the time on the channel here. We talk about its negative effects, its positive effects. But when we're looking at recovery and recovery from training, we really want to look at planning out those stressful events, right? So a lot of the time we think about stress as purely being an acute thing. Maybe something pops up at work. Maybe something drives into the back of you on the way home and now you're suddenly a lot more stressed out. Maybe you get injured and you're not able to train and that usual use of sport as a stress reliever isn't available to you. In all cases, when we're looking at good recovery protocols and good programming around that, we want to understand that certain sacrifices in other areas will have to be made. So if, I un if I'm a financial services uh, professional and I know that March and April are going to be very, very busy for me, this is not the time to plan the peak for your squat bench and deadlift. This is not the time to plan a month out from a bodybuilding competition. If you have stressful events coming up, if you're planning a wedding or something along those lines and you know that these four weeks are going to be absolutely up the walls, just push that stress, leave that there, do some nice easy training when you're going. Don't make that stress be any greater or any more severe than it has to be. When we're approaching large sporting events, the stress level we have in our system is going to accumulate higher and higher and higher. The use of a taper in training should hopefully help with that. The use of some other distractive methods will hopefully help with that. But understand your stress levels when you're planning out large training blocks and making sure you can recover for each of those sessions understand that stress is going to be coming from everywhere now you can't suddenly plan that you're going to have a falling out with your significant other you can't suddenly plan a major family event happening but in the cases where you can foresee stressful periods don't put heavy training periods around there it makes everything harder your recovery will be terrible you won't be sleeping as well you might suddenly get this chronic injury that pops up and you've no idea why it happened it's never happened before it's very likely just due to that higher level of systematic stress number 16 is get enough sleep i know this sounds like a cliche and you're like where is sleep how is it taking number 16 to get to sleep but sleep quality and quantity is one of the most important things when it comes to improving athletic performance, when it comes to things like fat-free mass, fat reduction, accuracy, decision-making, strength, endurance, energy levels, everything in all the way up until including some tentative results showing that if you're more sleep deprived, you're more likely to get injured during your sporting activity. So this encompasses every single possible athletic endeavor that you could be watching that you do when you're watching this channel. If you're watching this, sleep 
almost certainly negatively impacts one of the things you're trying to improve. Now, getting better sleep has been covered and you all know the things you need to do to get better quality sleep. All you need to do is go ahead and do them. People talk about morning routines and what you do in the morning and what kind of hydration you get in the morning and don't have coffee until then and meditating and talking to the Dalai Lama. But what's more important and I think more athletes would benefit is getting better quality sleep and having a nighttime routine, time when you go to bed specifically, times when you, for example, humbly could be introduced you to seek a sleep. This is one of the things we sell over at seekastrength.com. It contains some of the most important micronutrients you need to get to sleep, so no sedatives or any hormonal additions. But having a nighttime routine that actually improves your quality of sleep is far more important. It will negate the need for any of these morning routines because you're just going to wake up feeling better. Always happens anytime we have a consultation with an athlete or if we're talking to athletes, one of the first things we ask or one of the things we'll be asked is, how's your sleep? And everyone goes, um, you know, like, how many hours of sleep are you getting? And they say things like maybe like six or seven hours sometimes. But that is just not acceptable. You know it's bullshit. You need to be getting at least eight hours of sleep. The negative effects are very well documented in the general population for lack of sleep. The sleep and sleep deprivation in regards to athletes is actually quite a bit newer when we're talking about in the last 10 years but the evidence is overwhelming that you need at least as much as the general population if not more and potentially even some naps if it's available to you i know for a lot of you that naps aren't feasible time-wise but more sleep more better training without a doubt it is undeniable number 17 is don't compare yourself to others so you're like this is kind of a strange one to include and in things i should be doing or should be doing for recovery but this is a really important aspect when you're on stuff like the internet and you go online and you watch someone training and you see us talking about tushiki doing five by five five times a week and he's doing it at 85 percent and you think wow I'd really like to give that a go and if he can do it and he says he's natty so I can go do it right and the answer is you should compare yourself to nobody just one of the most impactful things that happens is we start comparing ourselves to someone else we start doing that Goggins thing where we're like no I'm going to train seven times a week and train really difficult or we'll ask people ask us they're like can I train extra days I'm doing four days a week currently can I move to five and the answer is like you just quality over quantity is the most important thing don't take notice of someone Someone could be training for 20 years. Someone could be taking gear and training for 20 years. Someone could have far better and possibly do have better genetics doing you than the people you're looking at online to compare yourself to them. You need to do what's right for you. You need to do the things you need to do. You need to progress from where you are to where you need to go next in the most logical and intelligent way possible. So I'd really encourage you to not compare yourself. If you're a weightlifter, don't go look at the Bulgarian method and think, I am the 18 year old who can do the Bulgarian method, Natty. You're not that guy. You're not that guy, pal. Don't, don't let that ruin your training don't step overboard learn from these athletes learn from these people learn from us watch us training watch other people training take all that valuable stuff that's how we learned a lot of stuff but don't try and skip that process if you're squatting 120 kilos now you don't need to do five times a week five by five at 85 percent and three sets of 10 drop sets to get to 140 kilos you really do not need to do that so just be super conscious of trying to up your capacity now in a too fast a method. So when we talked about intelligent training, that means smart incremental increases in your training capacity, literally over the courses of years, literally over the course of years. And that's how you slowly increase that baseline of recovery. So you going from three or four sessions a week of training to nine sessions a week is going to be detrimental. And it's hard when you're watching people and you get inspired, you get motivated. It's just so important to do what you need to do and what's smart is for you next. Number 18 then is program your mobility work. So this mightn't sound like a recovery aid or how is this going to help my recovery, but it will make a massive difference. So a lot of the time when we're looking at areas that are take a bit longer to recover or particular sessions that take longer to recover from, usually we're fighting something in that session. So it could just be a case where there's a lot of volume, a lot of intensity, it's difficult, I did a lot of damage to myself. But in many cases, maybe it's my overhead position is difficult to achieve, and now I have to take an extra 20 minutes to warm up into that. Maybe when I'm hitting those snatches or those power jerks, I really have to squeeze into that position a hell of a lot more. And now I suddenly have a whole other vector or a whole other introduction uh, from something that might not necessarily need to exist. So if I'm struggling on any of my ranges of motion, if my squat takes a lot longer to get into the bottom, or maybe I don't start hitting depth until I'm at 140 kilos, 
then I really need to look at those ranges of motion and those ranges of motion relative to each other and say, okay, this is clearly going to be stressing my lower back more because it's so hard for me to achieve those positions. In that case, having very, very simple amounts of just general range of motion program or mobility work program for yourself will make a gigantic difference. You're literally talking about 10 to 15 minutes per day of long hold static stretches or something along those lines, maybe some PNF stretching, which will make a massive difference to the range of motion in those joints or on those movements. So if it is something where you're struggling with squat depth and those squat sessions, you'd feel terrible afterwards, then just hit those three or four stretches or those two or three PNF stretches for 10 to 15 minutes per day every single day have it programmed out in the same way you program your squats it's completely reasonable for you to think i'm not going to do the same sets the same reps and the same load for my squats for the next four months whereas many of us will do the same amount of time for the same amount of sets on the same stretches for months and not see any real difference. You should be programming mobility as if you're programming the most important exercise in your training. We should see a general increase in volume, then we should see a shrinking of volume and an increasing in intensity. So it is very much something that should be in mind for you as you're programming your general training, you should be programming those mobility sessions too. Number 19 then, and the penultimate tip in the list of 20, is there is a difference between soreness and injury, and one of the key skills as an athlete is being able to understand this difference. So if you're somebody, you do five sets of 10 on your squats on a Sunday, you wake up on Tuesday morning and you feel like you can't bend your knees, that is probably just doms in your quads from those squats. Now, if we start seeing a slow building of an ache in one of the knees or one of the hips or the back, or we start suddenly getting a shooting pain or a nervy type pain in any of those, these are two completely different modes here. On one side, we have the expected soreness that we would have expected from that training session. On the other side, we have an acute bout of soreness or pain in this case that's coming from an injury or might be coming from the initial stages of a chronic injury happening. In the second case, we need to be very, very pointed with reducing load in training, reducing intensity in training, possibly needing to switch out some of those exercises, possibly needing to see a healthcare professional immediately in these cases. On the side of DOMS and muscle soreness, we probably need some alteration in load. We might need some alteration in our overall volume, but we're just going to keep training. We understand you're going to be sore when you start squatting. This won't last forever. The first two weeks are going to be the worst. I can keep trucking and I will make progress from it. But in the latter case, in the case where I now have a, an acute or chronic injury starting to form... In this case, if I was to keep trucking, even making adjustments in training, I am going to do damage to myself long term and it's going to be very hard to recover from. So it is difficult. It's difficult to be introspective and to be in some way fair with yourself. Many people are going to just keep pushing too hard, keep pushing on through those sore knees and sore back and end up developing tendonitis into tendinopathy and then having a whole other host of issues. Some people might be on the other end of that scale where they think everything's an injury, they stop training completely, and then they don't make progress. So it is difficult. I said at the start of this that this is very much a skill, and it is a skill. It's something that has to be developed. You just kind of have to be in the sport or that mode of training for a while before you start picking up on what do I need to be concerned about, and that's why you probably should have somebody helping you, or you should be looking for some educational resources as you're going through your training. Number 20 is the final one. The final tip is don't listen to your wearable. Your wearable cannot tell you in any definitive scientific manner how well recovered you are. It is simply not possible as yet with the technology. So when we look at sport and exercise science papers and when they look at how they test recovery, very often we have to do a couple of different aspects including hormonal markers like cortisol, we're looking at things like testosterone levels, we're looking at stuff like creating kinase, 
we're looking at mTOR, we're looking at mineral levels, we're looking at any number of very, very important blood markers, all the way up until actual physical tasks. So if we're looking at, for example, recovery for maximal strength, very often in these studies, they have to repeat the maximal strength test to actually show a definitive change in recovery or not recovery, even including any number of blood biomarkers or hormonal markers, whether that's taken from saliva or from the blood, it is something that has to be done as of yet. So any wearable thing you're using is usually taking maybe your HRV, it might be taking how much sleep it got, you got how much your uh, resting heart rate has changed, it might be taking your skin temperature, a couple of these different things which are useful and have been used in some studies. But as of right now, your wearable cannot actually predict how much or how well recovered you are and it is a terrible idea to listen to your wearable wristwatch to tell you're recovered it is very easily manipulated for example if you look at hrv you could wake up in the morning and some apps will give you a bad or a red score on your hrv and you get into a cold plunge for five minutes and suddenly your hrv is green or you get a massage for 15 minutes and your hrv is better that doesn't mean you've suddenly recovered as we've demonstrated and as multiple studies have demonstrated cold plunge doesn't help you recover in terms of actually performing athletic feats neither does that massage in terms of that direct recovery i can't go from doing that five by five five times a week to getting one massage and five minutes of a cold plunge to suddenly being recovered from that training session that's just not how recovery works so as of right now i feel very strongly about this your wearable wristwatch isn't something that can tell you now, they may use that term because recovery, again, is contextual and it's not really something that is based in science when we use a specific word because it's quite colloquial. So what you need to do is you can wear them, you can track that data, you can look at yourself and maybe it lines up with some of that aspect. But that term they're using is almost meaningless. It's almost making it meaningless and you shouldn't use it based on when you need to train. You need to train based on smart training principles maybe a knowledge of yourself and how you're feeling for sure but don't listen to your wearable wristwatch as of right now they are not taking blood biomarkers i don't think it's that far away i'll be honest i think it's probably something that's surely been developed and is probably within the capacity of technology within the next decade then i'll certainly be taking notice but as of right now we are not keen on people using your wearable wristwatch most often as well just to take note if we look at studies very often they're supported by people who have software in HRV and even more often it's people looking purely at aerobic capacity stuff which is not to say that it's not important there's plenty of you guys who watch this who are doing and follow for aerobic capacity training and how to support that and your strength training but it's not something that really looks at training as a whole when you include S&C when you include other aspects of that so forget about your wristwatch follow the data track it look at it write it down note it in your training book and when you're doing certain lifts and see if you can see a trend but as of right now, don't listen to what it's telling you.